Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. Today, we're doing some stuff with Sam Andrews. Sam? Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. I think what we want to do is some, is some content that folks can watch that's not as long as our usual stuff. Right. I do tend right. to run on. <laughs> I think it's good stuff, good information, but we want to make something a little bit shorter. So we're going to do a holster today, and Sam's going to go through it kind of fast, but if you guys want more details, we do have some other very detailed videos that you can go check out. And I believe that it is the Carjacker holster, Sam, that we've done some stuff with before. The Carjacker Crossdraw, it's been one of our most popular holsters. Mm -hmm. And these are much simpler to make than some of the really complicated things we've shown in the past. That's what but, you got right there? Yep. So you would be sitting down in the car and this would give you a good position to be able to quickly... It was designed originally for use in a vehicle. It was mm -hmm. designed for some of my law enforcement customers, but it's become super popular with a lot of people, both as a walk around holster, they're very comfortable, as well as use in the vehicle. As you see, it carries at an angle, which is when you're seated, very easy to draw coming up and across the body. It's simple on and off because it just wraps up around the belt. The rear snap sits above the top edge to keep it at a butt upward angle and then comes over to secure. So comfortable, quick, very convenient. What's the main difference between making this and anything else? Well, this is a simple one piece holster, folded construction, doesn't take a lot of intermediary steps. And that's good because we make an awful lot of them. Today I'm going to build one for the SIG P365 because that gun is hotter than a firecracker. We are making so many rigs for those. As we've seen in some of the other videos we've done, start with a pattern and we'll trace out the pattern on the leather. In this case also marking my stop start marks for stitching and the holes where the hardware goes I would also normally need to cut out a welt but I had several of these already made for the 365's so that is the spacer that will end up inside between the layers. The method of cutting that I stumbled on years ago that made life a lot easier was to put some scrap carpeting underneath the leather itself so that I could cut with the blade forward on the X-Acto knife. And the tip of the blade is just going into the carpeting. It's not hitting the table beneath. This lets me make a very controlled cut. It's very easy to steer and it parts it in one pass. I don't have to keep going over and over the same place. Next, we need to make the holes for the hardware. These are the two snaps that hold everything in place. And I always turn her over and back punch it so that the flow of the leather in the hole is going out that way, which just allows greater engagement of the snaps when I install them. Next, we're going to install the snaps. These are regular dot snaps, nickel over brass, so they won't corrode, place it on the anvil, put the snap setting tool in, and don't just smash the snap because that can collapse the barrel of it. I start by just lightly tapping to get the flare going so it's nice and even, then progressively hit a little harder 
and then I try to turn the snap to see that it's well set. If it turns, I need to hit it some more. There, nicely, evenly flared and set solidly. Now that we've got the hardware installed, we need to put in the lining. I can't allow any bare metal to be scraping against the firearm inside. So we're going to set this down on the suede, pop the weight on top to hold it in place. And then using our barge cement, get a good healthy coating evenly spread. I haven't found anything that holds more aggressively than the barge cement. Really, really good material. But you have to use it in a well ventilated area because you do not want to be breathing these chemicals. Also, I find if I make my stroke from the inside going outward toward the edge, I'm not going to build up any of the glue on the outside edge of the holster which if I came the other way, it would scrape off and that interferes later with finishing the edges. Make sure on your lining material to spread the glue a good deal wider than the holster that you're lining. It makes it much easier when you're putting them together because the glue only sticks to the glue. If I leave a dry place, it won't hold reliably. Now I'm going to give that a couple of minutes to set and dry a little and then we'll trim it off. And now we've had a little chance for the glue to dry, I take my smooth piece of plastic. Before I trim it, I run over all the edges just to make sure they are well and truly bonded before I start cutting things off. Anything hard and smooth will work. This is just a piece of Delrin. And you can see the outline of the holster there where we've pressed it down. Now using the sharper number two blade, I do the trimming. Now I take the holster off the edge of the table. My weight is holding it down. Pulling the lining snugly out allows me to follow the edge of the leather by sliding the knife along it and get a very even cut. Being careful, of course, not to get my finger on the underside. And as you can see, with this method of trimming, you come out very, very even all the way around. Now that we've got the lining trimmed off, we need to mark it for stitching. So I'm going to set my groover for the width I need for the stitching. The groove gives me a guide to stitch in. Also, it helps the stitches themselves to lay below flush. While I'm doing this, I will go ahead and groove the belt flap. This is not for stitching, but a grooved edge is more attractive than one just left plain. Oops, sticking a bit there. And we'll come back to that when we do the beveling. Now we need to stitch around the edge so that the lining and the holster never come apart. So we're going to use my old Landa 16. This is a harness making machine about 100 years old. And they don't make them like this anymore. This was specifically designed for making harnesses, holsters, heavy leather work. It's got an awl that makes the hole, then the needle comes up through the pre-made hole from below, catches the thread in the hook, and takes it down. So it really is bottom stitching. 
and it will sew anything you can get under the foot there. If you can fit it in, it will stitch it. Fingers included, so I'm very careful. Now to trim the thread, I like to use a scalpel. Any exacto knife would work, but these have a very fine point, which lets me get down right into the hole with the thread and cut it off below flush so we don't have any fuzzy ends coming out. Now we need to bevel these edges to round them and get rid of that square edge. These horseshoe brand bevelers, which have changeable blades, I found have a really good rounded radius and they're quite sharp when they come from the factory so they do a splendid job of taking off that edge and they're quite easy to maneuver in tight corners because of the short feet on them. I've used bevelers that have very long tines and they tend to hang up on things. I like to do a heavy bevel on the inside to get a good radius on that edge. Sometimes I even make two passes to kick off a little more of the material because with the gun going in against that edge I don't want it catching and peeling the lining away from the holster. Not that that's likely, but this prevents any possibility. I'm going to go ahead and bevel both sides of the flap as well, since this is what we're doing at the moment. Being a single layer of leather, this does not take as heavy a bevel. I'm using a smaller, narrower blade on the single piece, because I don't want to over bevel it and end up with a knife edge. It needs to be rounded, not made into a blade itself. From here, both pieces will need to be slicked. Now that we've beveled the edges, we need to slick them to get that really rounded, smooth edge. I like to use the power slicker to do the heavy work. Give the leather a good wetting. This has done about 80% of the slicking. Now I'm going to go over it with my hand tools to get that really fine, glassy finish. But it saves a lot of time if you can set up a slicking bar. Now that the slicker has gotten most of it, I'm going to take my hand tools and get that fine polish. I know it looks like I'm going in two directions, but I'm really only bearing down in one, which is coming toward me, because I want the edge slicked in the direction I'm going to eventually put on the edge coat. So I'm getting all the fibers laying down in this direction. So on the return, I'm not really pressing. I'm only pressing when I come in toward me. Now when I push it in with the slicking tool, it tends to mushroom the edge. So again, I take my slick piece of plastic afterwards and flatten it so it's not all rolled up. Same principle on the holster. Because this is lined and it's thicker, I'm using a larger wheel. This is not sold in leather tool stores. This is actually a pulley wheel from a hardware store. It came with a metal bracket, which we just removed. But since it's plastic and it's slick, it makes a great slicking wheel. Now for little corners, which the wheel can't get into, the smooth wood handle of a tool makes a fine piece for slicking. And like the other piece, I flatten those edges down. 
And they're finished. Very glassy smooth. Now that we've got all the edges slicked, it's time to bring it together and make a holster shape. Now this one gets a welt, a spacer, in between where I'm going to sew it together. I've done this by eye so many times, I don't usually do this step, but if it makes it easier for you, you can trace the welt for a glue guideline so you know where everything's going to go. I normally only glue one side of this until I get it installed and then put glue on the other side just because it's easier than handling something completely covered in sticky glue. When I place it, I trace the outside with my fingers. I want this as even as possible, not overlaying and certainly not back away from the edge because we don't want to create gaps when we bring all three edges together. Give that a minute to get tacky. All right, now the glue's gotten tacky enough, I can bring these edges together. And again, the critical part is lining things up so that you're as even as possible, and finger testing is the best way to tell. You don't want it sticking out, you don't want it sunken in. Now that we have it glued together, I'm going to take it to the belt sander and just true that off before I stitch it. Yeah. Now we've got it all flattened and evened out, ready for stitching. Now that I've sanded the edge flat, and put a groove there for my stitching guide, I need to trace the rest of it for stitching on the welt that's inside where I can't see. So, this keeps me where I need to be. Now it's back to the sewing machine. Now we need to trim it off again, getting the scalpel down into the hole with the thread. I'm going to touch it up on the belt sander just a little bit because the presser foot banging into the leather sometimes can shift the layers. And before I bevel it, I just want to make sure everything is totally straight. Now that I have the edge all straight, I want to bevel off those square corners I'm using my larger number three blade on these bevelers to get a good radius. Take it at two different angles to get that nice rounding effect. And now it's back to the slicking bar. Now I hit this on the power slicker that we showed you before just to give it the greater part of its smoothing. Now I'm going to take my tool handle and give it a rub down and get the edge angles for that really glassy finished edge. There we go. And I press that down flat to get rid of any mushrooming that may have occurred. She's ready now for molding and fitting. Now that we've got the holster physically all sewn together, it's time to shape it. So. First, dunk it in the water, get it good and soaked, and then I take my dummy gun, and sadly the company that made these aluminum ones has gone out of business. I miss them terribly. We can still get polymer guns and 3D printed dummies and all that, but these aluminum ones were wonderful. I could wail on them, pry on them beat them, 
<laughs> they stood it all. Okay. I take this dowel and I place it along the top to make a tunnel for the front sight. In this case, I do not push it all the way through because a tensioner is going to eventually go under the trigger guard to hold the gun and we don't want to overstretch the leather in this direction. So bringing this about that far will give us the nice ramp tunnel for the front sight but won't interfere with the tensioning. I could just mold it totally by hand, but I do so many thousands of holsters that gets to my arms. So I start things out by putting them in the molding press under layers of this neoprene rubber. Pump it down. It does about 80% of the shaping and that lets me just do the fine tuning shaping with the hand tools. Get your exercise every day here. Now leave it in there under pressure for about five minutes, and then it'll be all ready to go. All right, now we've let it sit under pressure for a few minutes. There we go. It's pressed most of the shape in. You could dry it and use it as a holster right now, but it's not pretty enough. So we're going to mold it. Being it's Florida and summer, I'm going to wear the glove on my holding hand because my sweat will turn the wet leather black. There's some chemical reaction between the salts of the sweat and the tannic acid. I don't want to take a chance. I use what I call the beaver tail mold to get the basic shape and then I have the pointier one to get highlights and fine detail. Molding in the sight tunnel so we'll have that tall area for the sight to run in. These molding tools were just made out of old wooden tool handles, just screwed onto a dowel so you have a T-shape to get leverage with. And then on a sander, just shape them to what you wish. I've used these two for the last, oh, probably 30 years of holster making. They're well worn in. There's the line of the frame to slide there that I want to highlight and it's easier if you use a straight edge. And there we have our 365 molded and ready to go out in the sun and get dry. Now that our holster is dried, I'm ready for finishing and I've put my name stamp on the flap because you have to sign your work. It's time to edge coat it and get the color. I like to use a mix of the brown edge coat along with the black tough coat from Weaver because I find the brown edge coat by itself is a little thick and gummy. Also it's a very very light brown. By mixing it two parts brown to one part black tough coat it not only thins it out, but it darkens it, so it has a very nice contrast and makes a much harder edge when it dries. On the holster, 
I do the inner edge first, just trying to keep my line as even as possible. As I'm trying to meld the line of the suede lining and the leather outer so you can't really see the split between them. And be careful not to hit the stitching with the edge coat because it will stain it and you won't get that stain out. This is why earlier I emphasized when slicking, I tend to slick in one direction, and that's the direction I'm going now with the dauber. I want all the fibers laying down in this direction so that it's not catching against the wool of the dauber when I'm bringing the edge coat in toward me. I'm always pulling it toward. It tends to make a much harder, slicker, and more finished edge. And there we are, edge coated, molded, dried, ready for its color finish as soon as that dries. And it only takes about five minutes for the edge coat to set up. And now that our edge coat is dry, it's ready for the coloring. This is the Neatsfoot Oil compound which gives it that beautiful russet, brown, deep old kind of saddle tan. You could dye it various colors, but by and large, I like the natural oil finish and the bulk of my customers request this color. Now when you put this first coat on, it will go quite dark, but in a few minutes when it soaks in, it's going to lighten up. So you'll probably need a couple hits to get it to a consistent color. Same thing with the flap. Since you're getting this from inside and outside, I don't go as heavy because it's easy to oversaturate with the oil and you don't want to go too far. If you oil soak it, it'll turn into a greasy dish rag and that's to be avoided. So, a couple of light coats until you get consistent color, and that works best. Okay, we've gotten enough coats on this over an hour that it's got a nice even color and it's not lightening up anymore. So it's time to put on the final sealer, the acrylic resoline, which I like to do with the airbrush because daubers will leave streaks and little bits of fuzz and everything stuck to the leather. The airbrush gets a much more even and lighter application. But you want to make sure that you don't overdo the resoline. Just a light coating and let that dry. You can always put on more, but you don't want it pooling up. Back on the peg, that will dry in just a couple of minutes, and then we can go to assembling for final form. Okay, now we have everything finished as far as leather, color, finish, sealant. It's just time to assemble this with the hardware so we can wear it. First thing I need to do is put the blind T-nut that everything attaches to in the back of the flap. Please forgive the noise in the background. We're having one of our Florida thunderstorms today, and it's coming and going. To drive in the T-nut to a, so not damage the threaded end, I'll put a screw into it as a guide. Then it goes into this hole on the metal block. And I'm just trying to get it flush with the surface so no edges are sticking up. Now to fit 
the tensioner to hold this pistol, I'm going to look in here, take my awl, come just below the bottom edge of the trigger guard, make a hole across there, and I just know by eye from the diameter of the rubber that's going to be used in there, how far off from the gun it needs to be. That's my guide. I take the hand punch, line it up with where that guide hole is. I have to twist it a bit to cut through the soft suede inside. Just pressing down doesn't quite get through all the layers. And now we have our hole for the hardware all the way through. This is gas hose, which I get from the auto supply store. It's a fiber reinforced heavy hard rubber, absolutely marvelous for tension retainers. Get it lined up with the awl. Place the screw through. And then match it up with the T-nut. And I left my screwdriver just out of reach. Once I get the threads going together there, now I'm going to check the angle where I need to make the hole here for the other anchoring hardware. comes through all the layers and I'm going to go back and forth a bit fitting this because when this flap snaps you want it to be tight coming across the top of the holster but have some looseness on the back to allow the belt room to come through and the pitch of it controls that so while I'm holding it in place I'll come through here with the awl stir that around to make a mark and show me where to punch it. Now we've got a hole made for where the flap will bear down to the bottom of the holster. And that angle is critical to get the tight on the back, loose on the front set up so the belt will come through easily. I've pressed against the snaps to make the impression and show me where the holes need to go. On this one, I punch to the top of the impression, again, to give it a little flex room for the belt that's going to go in there. Tap that to make sure I'm even side to side. Then we install our snaps. Cap on this side, socket on the inside. Spin it. Nope, it's well set. Same on the top. Good and set. Lastly, I just need to put the long T nut through here to combine those, and we are finished. This is the half inch long screw post, available from Tandy Leather or any leather supply basically. That anchors the bottom edge. We have our finished holster all set up and ready for wearing. That's how we make the carjacker cross draws. 
If you have any interest in these or any of our other products, you can see them all online at andrewsleather.com. If you have any questions, please call us directly. All the contact information is there on the website. And we're happy to help with whichever gun you need fitted. Absolutely. And a big thanks to to Sam here for sw he's sweating, I'm sweating. <laughs> it's a hundred degree floor today. Yeah. yeah, it's it's hot and, and uh, humid and raining. If you guys though want to see more details, just look at the channel. You see a lot of stuff. And like Sam said, call them up. Thanks, Sam. My pleasure. We're out of here. We'll see you guys in the next Peace one. Out. Peace. Make sure to check out handstrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.